Well, it's just a real privilege to be part of your mental health day. And uh, I'm actually a physician, and I got involved in mental health. There we go. So I'll tell, tell you a little bit about my story. I, I guess it's, uh, it's not that common to have a physician talking to you on Sunday mornings. Uh, I know I didn't bring a white coat because I didn't want to get you all nervous. Because <clears throat> then you'd start taking off your clothes and rolling up your sleeve. And... <laughs> but I'll tell you a little bit about my journey. When I graduated uh, from, uh, from medical school, I actually wanted to become an anesthetist. Is that, is that, uh, no, that's actually, that's just me, isn't it? Okay, so this is, well, that's probably, well, then there, let's go, how about that? Okay, there we go, now I'm at home. I actually became an anesthetist. I wanted to put people to sleep. And pe people just thought that was odd. Uh, as anesthesia is not a really popular specialty. Like people don't, uh, like little kids don't grow up saying, mommy, I want to be an anesthetist when I grow up. And that's because we didn't have our own TV show. But you can imagine what our TV show would be like, right? I mean, it'd be just like, it'd be kind of sleepy, wouldn't it? And, um, but then everyone would want to wear masks, which became really trendy here for a while. So, and so the reason I became an anesthetist is, and you may not know this, and this is something you should tweet, but anesthesia is the most godly of all medical specialties. You, you know, you're laughing, but, uh, but, it's, uh, but actually it's God's favorite medical specialty. You know why? What was God's first medical act? He put Adam to sleep, right? So that was, if, it, if that was the first thing he did medically, then that's the most important. That's his favorite. Surgery was totally secondary. And so I just knew that that was, I was a Christian. I wanted God's will for my life. I just knew that he wanted me to be an anesthetist. You know, there's, but there's a second reason why I knew that this was God's, that this was the most spiritual and godly of all the medical specialties because it's also the most, it's the most like being in the ministry. Same reason, yeah. So, but in anesthesia, the reason it appealed to me so much is anesthesia is all about control. Control of other people, which is really handy. And so, the thing about anesthesia, you control everything about a person's life, like all their vital signs, like, you know, brain waves, like everything, okay? You can, you can even control surgeons and nurses and administrators, like it is a fabulous, perfect for control freaks, which is what I was at the time. And, but it's even better, there's gadgets. Like, you know, there's, there's all these, like I wasn't good with power tools, so the gadgets was, like it was fantastic. You know, there's buttons and dials and things go up and down. And, but the, the, also too, anesthesia, everyone does what they're told. The patients. You don't have to negotiate, you know, you just, you know, do you feel like going to sleep? You know, how are you doing today? Did you sleep well last night? Do you want to sleep now? Do you have anything else planned for today? Like it, it just, it, you know, everyone does what they're told immediately. And the drugs work instantly. Like, it is, it is just, you know, you just, when the syringe is empty, everyone's quiet. You know, it's, you know, you, and, and another fabulous thing about anesthesia is you never have to listen to anyone for more than 10 seconds. <laughs> you can be warm and fuzzy and pastoral because you just know in 10 seconds, they're going to be quiet. You know, they, they, uh, should I count backwards? Count forwards, you know, try to count sheep. I said, count goats. I said, you can do square roots of prime numbers from 100. Like, it, it doesn't matter because in 10 seconds, it's all over. <laughs> so, anesthesia was just a perfect fit for me. But here was the problem. Because I was in a small town, the, in, because I was, in, I was in a small town, I don't know if you have this slide. Do you have my, no, I don't, I don't think you, I don't think you have that slide. But because I was in a small town, in the mornings, uh, we did surgery, but in the afternoons, the, the, uh, the ORs were closed, and the anesthetists all became GPs. Well, you can imagine how awkward that was for me to be a GP. I mean, you had to wear street clothes, you had to take your mask off. And, and in general practice, the drugs work really slow if anyone bothers to take them. No one does what they're told, and you have to listen to people for more than 10 seconds. Well, after 10 seconds, I just sort of glaze over, unless they're having trouble sleeping. Well, then, fine, lie down, I'll put up the IV. I'm good at that. So it was awkward for me, but what was actually the most awkward part of general practice for me was people came to see me with a different kind of pain that I knew nothing about. See, I didn't know there were two kinds of pain. I knew all about physical pain, and the, the, the treatment for physical pain was real simple. 
for me, you just put them to sleep or put a needle this long into their back between contractions. Like that solves everything. But people came to see me with a different kind of pain. You know, there's two kinds. There's physical pain. You know what the other one is? Emotional pain. And which do you think is the most common? Emotional. Which do you think is the most prolonged? And which do you think is the most disabling? That's right. And I knew nothing about emotional pain because they, they, in the school I went to, we had to have a personality extraction to graduate. And so we didn't have emotions. We didn't have personality. We didn't have feelings. We were just machines. And so people came to see me with problems with their feelings. And I thought, feelings? Like, who cares about feelings? I said, you know, to me, if you're breathing without a machine and, you're, and you have a pulse, like, what else do you want? To me, that's, in, to an anesthetist, that's your goal, okay? If you get to that point, we're all happy. And so people came to see me with all these feelings problems. And so I didn't know what to do because I, I didn't have any feelings and I didn't get it. And, and, I, and most of them were Christians because I attracted a Christian population. And so I said, well, you know, why are you coming to see me about your emotional problems? Why aren't you talking to someone in your church community? Well, they said, I can't. I'm too ashamed. They're all walking in victory, and I'm the only one who's struggling. Or others said, you know, I talked to someone from my church, and they said, read the Bible and pray more. So I, op I just, you know, just opened up my Bible, and I was in numbers. And so I just got a math lesson. I didn't really get very far, and I didn't know what to pray. So, I, you know, I, I just gave up. And uh, another person said, she said, well, I'm, I'm, she said, I'm too ashamed that I tried, to, I tried to talk to someone, they just didn't know what to tell me. And one lady said, so I'm stuck with you. <laughs> and so I, I just felt so badly that Christians just didn't know where to, they didn't know who to trust, where to turn for help, what to, how to navigate through the problem of emotional pain. And so I decided I would try to help. And uh, so I just started to, to, to experiment and treat people for depression, and, and they started to get better. And then, so then I tried another, I, the next person came in, I tried them. And then people started to get better, and then words started to get around, and people started to come from all over North America. And uh, so I gave up anesthesia, gave up general practice, and then I had a mental health clinic for about 30 years. And so that's how I ended up, um, you know, in this, con in this world of mental health. So I became very skilled at matching medications to different kinds of thinking patterns. It, mood, I started treating depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder. That, that was my uh, area of expertise. But I got a little out of, I mean, that's all I knew. In fact, I saw so many people who, that when, they were, when their depression recovered, they, they got their lives back, their marriages back, their careers back, their, their relationship with God came back. Like, so many things improved. I just felt we should put this in the water supply, and everybody should be on this stuff because it seems to be helping everybody. And everybody, everyone who came to see me seemed to need it, so I just thought, let's just treat everyone. So. But God knew I needed a little bit more well-roundedness. And so a couple of years later, uh, I, uh, I had to admit one of my patients to hospital because she was so depressed. And when I was doing my rounds and, and my morning uh, visits with her, uh, in the middle of my conversation, her eyes glazed over, a voice came out of her saying, leave her alone, she's ours. Well, what do you do with that? You know, there's no pill for that. And so suddenly I realized that I had entered the twilight zone and that, that there was another dimension to mental health that I was unaware of, but there was a spiritual dimension. And so I had to really quickly understand uh, how to navigate the spiritual world and spiritual authority and spiritual attack because, you see, I was raised in the church, so I knew nothing about demons. All I knew was that they were overseas and that only missionaries had to deal with this because they're not in Canada, and they're certainly they would never, ever bother a Christian. <laughs> and so uh, suddenly I became like, whoa, you know. In fact, this lady had never been out of Canada. I'm thinking, how did this get into Grimsby and into my hospital when I was told this couldn't happen? Uh, so that, wow, this is a booby trap. There. <laughs> so, so then I, I actually discovered the Freedom in Christ uh, materials from Neil Anderson, which is a powerful powerful ministry to understand spiritual authority and spiritual warfare and, and how to navigate the spirit world. And so I really recommend all of their tools. Okay, so I thought at that point I was balanced, okay, that I understood there was a spiritual realm. Oh, yeah, there's my picture. There's my picture of what was going on in my office. Like for about, for about two years, we had a demonic manifestation in my office almost every month. So it was a really wild and crazy place to work. But I had to, I had to understand the spiritual tools and the medical tools. 
So a few years after that, God just knew it was time for me to go on to the next step in my training program. And so then we had a marriage crisis. So this is Kathy and I, the day we started out. And of course, we were just perfect. What could possibly go wrong? And I know as you look at that picture, you're, you're just, you're, your, your jaw probably dropped that Kathy and I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> I know, it's true, it's shocking, isn't it? And so, so we had a marriage crisis, and I knew there wasn't a pill for this, and this was not a demonic issue, so, so, so then I thought, well, Kathy should see a counselor, because she needed help. And, but I was willing to go with her to be supportive. And so we went to the counselor, and he just, he, after he heard our story, he just said, look, you are both so messed up. I have to see you separately because you, need, you both need help, and I'm not going to see you together until you both have dealt with your issues. And I thought, like, no, it's her issues. No, but anyways, so, and so he taught us something uh, that was absolutely life-changing. That's why we're still together. Uh, it was absolutely life-changing for us, and he taught us that God wanted us to be more than saved. Now, I knew all about salvation. I was raised in the church my whole life, and so I knew lots about salvation, how important it was, but I didn't know he wanted us to be more than saved. And you see, God wants us to be saved and transformed. Now, what does transformation look like? See, I didn't know anything about transformation. I just knew everything about salvation. So what does transformation look like? Well, it looks like this. God wants to give you a heart transplant. He wants to take your wounded, scarred, broken, damaged heart and replace it with his heart. And see, that's part of salvation, is you enter the kingdom and then he wants to give you a new heart so that you can be transformed. But how do you do that? Well, that's in the verse, I hope, yes, that's in Romans 12 and 2. Don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I grew up in the church, as I told you, and I heard this verse preached many, many times. And so I remember thinking, especially as a teenager, that, okay, okay, I'm going to transform my mind, I'm going to renew my mind, I'm going to think, you know, and that lasted about 10 seconds, and I realized I can't do it. And, the, and so I just gave up, like most of my peers, because no one ever told us how to do it. They just quoted the verse. They didn't tell you how. Well, that's not, as, that's not very helpful. And so I'm going to tell you how. The way you can be transformed by the renewing of your mind is to change how you think. But how do you change how you think? You know, you can't just say, okay, I'm going to think different from this day on. Well, that's not easy, okay? To change how you think, there, there's, there's different parts of how you change how you think. And so there's an easy-to-understand diagram that explains there's three parts to changing how you think. Because the Bible says in Thessalonians, Thessalonians, Thessalonians that, there are, that you are body, soul, and spirit. Well, each of these three parts have an enormous impact on how you think, feel, and relate to other people. So, so the physical side of you is, the, is your temporary container that relates to the planet through your five senses. And your spiritual, your spirit, is the part of you that relates to the invisible world, the kingdom of light or the kingdom of darkness you choose. But your, person, your soul is your personality, so that's the part of you that relates to other people. Now, your personality is shaped by two things, by the events of your past, but more important than the events of your past, it's the interpretation you made about those events. See, the interpretation is more important than the event. See, two people can have the exact same event and have two completely different interpretations. So, the simplest example is when uh, the 12 spies went into the Promised Land. Remember, Israel was about to enter Canaan, the 12 sp spies went in, and they had the identical experience, but completely opposite interpretations. So your interpretation of what happened in your past is more important than what actually happened because that shapes your personality, your outlook in life, how you see things. Now, your, the events of your past and your interpretation, which shapes your personality, are stored in what we call your emotional baggage. So your emotional baggage is, is, is the accumulated total of the events and your interpretations. Now, that baggage can be small or big depending on what you've lived through. So if you have a, a really painful past, a lot of traumatic things have happened to you, then you, you, you believe a lot of really bad things about yourself, others, and even God, and you believe a lot of lies about yourself, others, and God, 
And so let's just have a look at this fella. So he has a, he has a very difficult past, which has really damaged his self-esteem, self-confidence, self-image. And so his, his personality is really damaged. But he now wants to become a Christian. So what happens to his three parts, body, personality, and spirit, what happens to these part, three parts the moment after he accepts Jesus and says a sinner's prayer? Well, let's just go through the three parts. What happens to his spirit the moment after he says the sinner's prayer? Well, it changes ownership, right? Moves from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. It, and it's 100%. So 100% of his spirit moves into the new kingdom because it's a legal transaction. But what happens to his body? Well, what, happens to your, what happened to your body the moment you became a Christian? Probably nothing. But we do get a new body later, and no one seems to be in a big rush to get it. <laughs> but that's coming, okay? Never worked with your iPad before. Oh, there we are. So, then what happens to his baggage, his personality, the moment after salvation? Well, did your personality automatically completely change the moment after you became a Christian? No. So what happens is, after we become a Christian, we become a Christian with baggage. <laughs> and we just wrap our, our religious clothes around it. And so in the church culture that I was raised in, uh, no one ever talked about baggage. We just, we just uh, actually back then we wore jackets and ties and so that we just looked very religious and we just, uh, we learned the jargon. You know, you just learn Christianese and everyone's walking in victory and we just had an agreement that I'm not going to talk about your baggage and if, if you don't talk about mine and uh, because there's nothing you can do about it anyway, so why even bring the subject up? And so, and so the problem is that if you've never dealt with your baggage, you actually aren't being transformed. Now, some of you are thinking, well, I don't think I have any baggage. I'm fine. You know, I had a pretty good past, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty intact. I, you know, I'm, I'm just doing just fine. But here's a real simple test to how to tell if you have baggage, and that is, do you ever overreact to anything ever? <laughs> well, if you over, ever overreact to anything ever, what that means is, What's in front of you is triggering a painful memory or a painful experience from your past because overreaction means you're reacting differently than, to other, than other people who are in the same situation. So that means that, you, that something is being triggered from your past. But on the other hand, do you underreact when you should be reacting? In other words, are you so frozen and so emotionally um, dead inside that you're not responding when you really ought to? Well, those are all symptoms of, um, symptoms of baggage. So, you know, you can do your own self-assessment right now. But if you've never dealt with your baggage, you really look like this. Now, is this guy walking in victory? But does he know, does he, does he know the truth? Well, he has a Bible. Does he know how to use the Bible? That's the problem. Okay, he has a Bible, doesn't really know how to use it. Does he have spiritual armor? Sure. Does he know how to use it? No. Is he trying really hard? Yeah. Like, is he pulling himself up by his own bootstraps? Sure. He's trying really hard. But is he making a lot of progress? No. Does he have a sense that there's something wrong? Yes. But does he know what's wrong? No. Okay, so what's holding him back from walking in victory? His baggage. Okay, the events of his past and the conclusions that he made about them. Now, do you think this fellow is a powerful evangelistic force? Do you think people look at him and say, I want to be just like you? Okay, you know, what, what, makes you, what makes you tick? I want to be just like you. No. When the world looks at a Christian who hasn't dealt with their baggage, they just say, I don't want to be like you. You just belong to a service club on Sundays, and, you know, I'm busy. And so, do you think Satan's intimidated by a Christian who looks like that? No. But can you imagine... How would this person's life be different if he learned how to use the Word of God, if he learned how to use his spiritual armor, and he actually got rid of his baggage, and he started to walk vertically in his gifts, callings, and anointing in the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you think his life would be different? Hmm. Now, what percentage of Christians do you think look like that? Quite a few. 
Now, could you imagine how would it transform an individual or how would it transform a church if everyone got rid of their baggage, walked tall, knew how to use their spiritual armor, how to use the Word of God, and walked in their gifts, callings, and anointing the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you think that would change a church? Mm-hmm. In fact, there is nothing scarier or more intimidating to the kingdom of darkness than a Christian who's walking free of their baggage because a Christian who's walking free of their baggage is unstoppable because he has no... He has nothing he can grab to hold you back if you're free of your baggage. And that's why he is so intent on you hanging on to your baggage, because he wants you to stay like that. But is that Jesus' will for you? No, okay. But a lot of Christians look like that. So why, if that's not God's will, I mean, clearly it's not God's will, why is it that such a high percentage of Christians are still struggling with the baggage of their past and they're not walking in victory, and they're just crawling, okay? Why is that? Well, the most common reason why so many Christians look like that is this. We don't talk about it. It's that simple. I mean, how can you, how can you recover from anything that you're not aware of? Like, how can you discuss and even, how can you even approach a subject or a problem if you're not even aware the problem exists? And so this, I think, is the most common reason why so many Christians struggle with their baggage is they are just not aware that they even have the problem because nobody's talking about it. Actually, that slogan on the T-shirt, actually, a fellow in our home group, actually, when we were talking about baggages, he said, oh, no, denial works for me. And I thought, wow, we should put that on a T-shirt. <laughs> but here's another reason why so many Christians are struggling with their baggage and not making progress is because someone told them it was their cross to bear and there was nothing you could do about it. Well, that just puts an end to, to any kind of transformation, doesn't it? And so if you were just told that, no, I'm sorry, if, if that was your upbringing, well, you know, too bad. And, you know, in heaven it'll all be great, but, you know, I'm sorry, as long as you're on earth, nothing's ever going to change and you're just going to have to put up with it, okay? That's a demonic lie, okay? That's like saying you have to stay in your sin, okay? And so... That's not true either, but that's really common. You know, it's just your cross to bear. But then the third reason why so many Christians still are struggling with their baggage is because to actually be transformed, to change how you think, to get rid of your baggage is voluntary. You don't have to do it. You see, like this fella, he's going to heaven. He'll just crawl there, okay? But this is not a salvation issue. This is a personal freedom and transformation issue, okay? So it's all voluntary. So I like to think of the, uh, the picture I use when I'm thinking of the voluntary aspect to transformation is I like to think of the kingdom of God is a, it's like a walled city that has a single entrance, which is Jesus himself. But when you enter, you're, it's in my picture, that it's, it's as if you're given two potential pathways once you enter the kingdom. And one is the pathway of transformation where you actually give Jesus permission to transform you, to change how you think and to unload your baggage and to come to the place of greatest intim intimacy with him and to walk in your gifts, callings, and anointing in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's one path that you can choose. But there's a second path, which is a whole lot more popular, and that's to just, just get into the kingdom and park. So in other words, you just enter the kingdom and go no further. And you just, you just stay in your emotional pain. You just keep all your bad habits. You just stay bitter, angry, resentful, unhappy, unforgiving, holding tightly to your baggage, and totally saved. And that crowd is a whole lot bigger than the crowd that's transforming because that other crowd doesn't talk about it. But if you want to actually be transformed and you want to move into the transformation pathway of freedom, you have to be aware that there are three potential obstacles to your transformation that Satan wants to use to stop you or discourage you or to hold you back so you give up because it's just, you, he doesn't, because he wants you to say, oh, this is too hard, I can't do it, okay? And so I want you to know about these three obstacles in advance so as you encounter them, you'll say, yep, I knew this was, this was possible and I know what to do about it so it's not gonna hold you back. And these three obstacles correspond to the three parts of humans that I told you about earlier. So. In the physical realm, you can have physical conditions that interfere with how you think, feel, and relate to others. So these are the mental health conditions, like depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder, any mental health condition interferes with your thought control. 
So that will slow down your transformation. That's, a, that's an obstacle to transformation. And in the spirit realm, Satan hates your guts. And he wants to stop you. And the way he wants to stop your transformation is just convincing you that, uh, that it's hopeless, you're never going to make any progress. He just wants to drop his discouraging thoughts into your mind to slow you down or stop you. And you just say, oh, it's just too hard, I give up. Okay? And in the personality area, what the obstacle there is, if you just have a lot of baggage, a lot of painful experiences of your past, it, you just might think it's too intimidating, it's just too hard to actually go through the process of healing. And so all of these three areas, the enemy wants to use to hold you back. Because remember, what he is most afraid of is a Christian who's walking free. That's what he's most afraid of. So he will use any excuse to convince you that, you know, I'm just fine the way I am, okay? You know, denial's working for me. So, so when I wrote the book Emotionally Free, because this is an enormous subject, um, so when I wrote this book, I just divided the book into these three parts on how to walk through each part. So, the, the, so how to walk through the mental health, the spiritual issues, and how to unload your baggage. So we, at the back resource table, we brought all our resources on how to walk through all of these, these three areas. Okay. And then we have an online uh, course called Free Your Mind, which will walk you through all of these three areas, and all that information is on the, the back table. And, uh, and then we even have a website that, if you go to our website, we actually put out a free five-minute video every Wednesday on how to change how you think. So there's tons of information, but that's all on the, on the website. So God doesn't want you to stay struggling with your baggage. And so... If we talk now about the, if we just talk briefly about each of the three circles, just I want to just touch on each uh, briefly. In the physical realm, so these are the mental health conditions. So that's what I spent most of my career working on. These are invisible handicaps. You can't tell if a person's struggling with their mood. But here's a real easy way to understand it. The ability to form a thought is a physical event because you need nerve cells talking to each other to give you control of your thoughts. And so, Nerve cells can malfunction the same way any other part of your body can malfunction. And so if they uh, malfunction, you lose thought control. And if you lose thought control, you lose control of your mood, okay? And so you can have blurred thinking the same way you can have blurred vision. So for blurred vision, you, you can wear glasses to sharpen your vision. If you have blurred thinking, which is a loss of thought control, there are medicines to give you back the, the control of your thoughts, and that will correct your mood. And so that's, that's what I did for my career, is helping people with that process. And so we have all kinds of self-assessment tools, how to tell if you need medicines, how to tell if you have depression, anxiety, bipolar. So all that information's on the table. So you can um, ask us uh, when you're there. But, in the, in the, but it, let's talk about baggage, because that's more common. 20% of the population is struggling with a chemical imbalance mood disorder. So it's very, very common. But 100% of us have issues with our baggage. So let's take the lid off the baggage and look inside. So how does baggage form? Well, whenever you have a significant emotional wounding event, especially in childhood, because that's when you're most vulnerable, when something happens that's very upsetting emotionally, it, your, your personality is shaken. It's almost like your, your personality is, is like wet cement. And you're, as a child, you're struggling with, why did that happen? You know, how, come I can't, how to make sense out of this trauma that I've just experienced? And, and you're very vulnerable at that moment because you're in pain and you're swirling, looking for an explanation. Well, the enemy who created the trauma comes up to you and starts to whisper into your mind his interpretation or the lie that he wants you to believe about what happened. So if it, let's say you were bullied. Then he would just say, well, you know, you really are unlovable. You really are defective. You really aren't as good as everybody else. And you really are, you know, you're no, no one's ever going to accept you. And you really will be rejected for the, for the rest of your life. And when you're little and you don't have a better explanation, you just go, yeah, I guess that's right. But as soon as you agree with his lie, then you, gave, you give that lie power over you and it becomes a stronghold. And a stronghold is a pattern of thinking based on a lie. And so as soon as you believe and agree with the lie, it then gets stored in your baggage along with the painful memory, and it now, be, it now becomes ammunition for the enemy to throw at you for the rest of your life as long as you carry that baggage. So even as an adult, 
long after you've forgotten the bullying and, you know, you could be a very successful adult, in the back of your mind, he will keep reminding you. But, you know, you really are a loser. You're no, you know, people are going to reject you. It doesn't matter what, how they're smiling. They're going to reject you because that, the, the lies are still active. Okay? The lies are buried alive in your baggage. And so, so your, your baggage is not quiet. It's actively attacking you all the time. And that is Satan's ammunition. But with prayer ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit, you can actually unload, unload your baggage so you don't have to live like that anymore. And see, this, this verse here in Hebrews uh, 4 and 12, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So the word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit can unload your baggage if you give him permission. Remember, transformation is voluntary. You don't have to do it, so it's not a salvation issue. But it's available to you. Now, in the spirit realm, of course, I told you, Satan hates your guts, and he wants to influence your thoughts. And so he is always trying to fill your mind with his thoughts to hold you back. And where do you think he gets all those thoughts? It's from your baggage. You see, as long as you have baggage, as long as you believe lies, that, as long as you have those strongholds, which you agreed to, he has ammunition to throw at you. So he'll just keep pounding you with those lies as long as you give him permission to because you're, you still have that baggage. And so the, the demonic attack on your mind is very frequently just reminding you of the lies that have accumulated from the pain of your own past. And so what's the key to ending the demonic attack on your mind? Remove his ammunition. Unload the baggage. He has nothing more to throw at you. Okay, so that's why he loves baggage and he doesn't want you to ever deal with it. That's why he tries to talk you out of it all the time so you never touch it. But the good news is we can be free. We don't have to put up with his attack. And you see, when, when you use these, this, the weapons that we have available, that's how we do it. So the key is in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 to 4. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So, how do we empty our baggage? And we, and we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. So, the goal is, remember, the goal from Romans 12 and 2 is to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, renewing of your mind is the same as taking every thought captive, because when you've taken every thought captive, you've changed how you think your mind is being renewed. So, we just work backwards through this verse. So, to take every thought captive, you demolish arguments and every pretension, which is referring to the lies that you've accumulated throughout your life in your baggage. And then, how do you do that? Is you use weapons not of this world, that have divine power to demolish strongholds. Okay, so you just work backwards through this verse. If you wanna have, if you wanna take every thought captive, then you use, and you want to get rid of the strongholds, which are all those lies, you use weapons not of this world. And the nuclear weapons we have available to us in the spirit world are, are two, repenting and forgiving. Repenting and forgiving. You see, Satan has no defense against those weapons. If you repent and forgive, he, he's powerless. And those are the keys to unloading your baggage. And you see, when you use those weapons, this is what happens in the spirit world. He's defenseless. He cannot resist a Christian who's repenting and forgiving as God brings up the memories of the past and the lies that they've been accumulating. And this is actually my favorite verse. This is my most motivating verse in the Bible, to me anyways. The kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. You see, talk doesn't change anyone. In fact, you can read my book, you can memorize my book, you can know everything about emotional health, mental health, spiritual health, and how to unload your baggage and never change a bit. Head knowledge doesn't change anyone. Only a heart experience changes people. You see, there's a huge difference between knowledge and belief. You can know a whole lot of things but not believe it, okay? and so. The kingdom of God is about power. You see, you need supernatural power if you're going to demolish strongholds. 
You don't demolish a stronghold just because, well, I think I'm just going to stop thinking that way. Well, how long do you think that will last for? You need supernatural power to actually empty the baggage, heal the wounds of the past, remove the lies, and replace it with God's truth of who you really are and how he feels about you. That's the key to transformation. And you see, the problem is, most Christians actually look like this. You know, we're going through life, dragging our baggage. We're managing. You know, we're, we're managing. You know, we're doing the best we can. But we're struggling unnecessarily. This was not God's intention. God wants us to be free. Remember, the Bible says Jesus came to set us free. And not just free of our sins, free of our baggage, free of our past, free of all the ways we used to think. Okay, that's part of the salvation package. But most of us, like myself, I only knew about getting saved, getting into the kingdom. But Satan, the, re the reason we don't talk about the rest of the, the process is because Satan will do anything to prevent that conversation from happening because he's so afraid of us being transformed. So too many of us are walking like that. We're putting up with a problem that Jesus actually wants to release us from. So the good news is, Today, Jesus is coming alongside that cart with a different vehicle, and what he's saying to you right now today is, do you want to be transformed? Do you want to speed this process up? Do you want to let me help you be transformed so you can live free? You can have a freedom you never even thought was possible, and you then can change how you think, you can take every thought captive, and you can have your mind renewed. But the key is, you have to give God permission to begin to show you what's in the baggage, what lies have you been believing, and, and then what's the truth of who you really are. And you see, today, Jesus is actually saying to you, give me permission to either start or accelerate that process in your life. And the key is to take your baggage to the cross. The key is to take your baggage to the cross. See, Jesus came to take away your sins, but he also came to take away your baggage. He wants you to be free of the wounds of the past and all the lies you've accumulated over all those years that have really diminished your self-esteem, self-confidence, self-image, your relationships. It's, it's, it's colored your personality. It's colored every part of your life. And he wants to set you free from that. So to end the struggle, Jesus doesn't want you to leave today carrying the same load you walked in with. But... It's voluntary, remember? You have to give them permission. So if you would actually like to begin that process, then I want you to stand up, and I want to pray with you, because we're just going to give God permission to begin that process in our life so that we can be transformed. Father, we just come before you today, and we are so grateful that you love us so much, that you, you came to take away our sins and our guilt and our shame, which is just so wonderful but you also came to set us free from our baggage and that you want to heal the wounds of our past. You want to, to expose all those lies we've been believing for so long and replace them with the truth of who we really are, how you see us, so that we could have the truth. And so our personalities can be healed, our relationships can be healed, our walk with you can be healed. Father, we want to walk in our gifts, callings, and anointing in the power of the Holy Spirit unencumbered with the lies of, of, our, of our wounded past that, that have plagued us for so long and held us back. Father, today we give you permission to show us who do we need to forgive? Who do we need to forgive? The people who were responsible for wounding us, the, the, the events that happened. Father, do we need to forgive ourselves? Do we, 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 the, yourself is the hardest person to forgive. Father, do we need to forgive ourselves for things that have happened in the past that we just have held over ourselves and just said, no, you, you, I can't forgive myself. I was just too awful. Father, give us the grace to forgive ourselves. If you've forgiven us, who are we to say that was not enough? Father, give us the courage to forgive ourselves and to forgive the people who, 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 who damaged us. And Father, what do we need to repent for? What, what things do we need to repent for? What, what role did we play in some of these events that we need to repent for so that we can be completely resolved of that guilt and shame? 
Father, we just, we don't want to leave here today carrying the same load that we walked in with. And we give you permission now to begin to, to point out events in our past that you want to heal. Events in our past where we started to believe lies about ourselves and about others and about you. Father, we give you permission to, to expose these lies and then replace it with your truth so that we would begin to see that we are your anointed children. We are royalty. We are wrapped in royal garments and you see us as special and precious in your sight. Father, we want a new revelation of who we really are, not the damaged, broken, wounded person that we've lived with for so long. So Father, we just thank you that this is just all part of your love for us and we want more of it. So Holy Spirit, come today and transform us. Open our hearts and our minds. Increase our, open our spiritual ears so that we would see, we would hear your voice and, and see your pictures that you're giving us in, in, in our mind of memories that you want to heal. So Father, we're just so grateful that you love us that much. In Jesus' name, amen.